everybody, welcome back. This week we're gonna be talking about antibiotic resistance, antibiotic stewardship, and botanical medicine. I have a great guest today, her name is Brianna Wiles. She's found at Rooted Apothecary um, on Instagram, that's how her and I met. And then I'm Dr. Shana Keller, I'm a naturopathic doctor, and you can find me at naturopathic underscore Dr. Shana on Instagram. What I'm gonna talk about today is what is antibiotic resistance, what are the stats about it? Because it's kind of scary in my mind. And we're going to talk about some super bugs. Antibiotic stewardship, what does that even mean? And how does herbalism play a role in antibiotic stewardship? And we're going to talk about a handful of herbs. I was really excited. I got a little nerdy with some of the herbs in the newer papers that have come out in the last couple of weeks. So, or excuse me, last couple of years. Let's start with some antibiotic resistance stats. Because I remember hearing about super gonorrhea. Mm, 2018, 2019, 2020, actually the facts that I found was 2020, and it first came out in Australia. Cool. There's no treatment course, for it. So there's no there. antibiotics that it work for super gonorrhea. Um, there's also another strain, I'm not sure if you've heard about it, called uh, super candida auris. Yeah, I have. That's there. been really big this year. Mm -hmm. It's been dating the hospitals and everywhere. Exactly, so yeah. these nosocomial infections are really scary. The stats I pulled from the CDC, and I'll take that with grain of salt, but the annual deaths worldwide from antibiotic uh, resistance are 1.27 million. That's a wow. lot. That's a lot of humans that are losing their life because we are overusing antibiotics. In the United States alone, we have 2.8 2, 2. million cases with 35,000 deaths. 35,000 deaths. And then if we include Clostridia difficile, C. Yep. diff, yep. we're at 48,000 deaths. Right where we were leaving off, we were talking about C. diff infections, which are related to antibiotic overuse that causes chronic diarrhea. And really the only way to treat it in the United States is fecal microbial transplants, which we're not talking about today, but you were just sharing something um, about a friend of yours with a strep infection. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's, should I share that? Yeah. About using antibiotics, or just using antibiotics. Yeah, about overuse, because that's a great example, yeah. in my opinion, of like inappropriate use of antibiotics. Yeah. Well, yeah, because you don't know. You have no confirmed thing of it. I mm -hmm. mean, anyway. When you're not supposed to be sharing antibiotics anyway. No. You're supposed to do the seven or 10 day course, and I have a lot of patients that really don't want to do that. They want to save them and like, oh, I don't want to create antibiotic resistance, but actually you are creating antibiotic resistance by not, by finishing, not finishing your course. Yeah because then the bacteria get smart and they can mutate and that's how we end up with antibiotic resistance. Yeah. And the trouble is, is when we have these super smart bacteria that resist, 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 and now they're resisting all of the classes. In my opinion, antibiotics are a life, they're one of the categories of medications that I actually think is like a modern miracle. Yeah. And there's very few of those, in my opinion, with pharmaceuticals. There is. No, they, they <laughs> but pharmaceuticals, are, but antibiotics are just so great. Yeah. So. What do you know about antibiotic stewardship? Um, I, I, I don't know. I, I've never used that term before. Oh, I love this term. So antibiotic stewardship is the appropriate use of antibiotics as needed. Now, I don't know about you, but I learned that oh, strep okay, throat... Okay, so that's like... Yeah. yeah. Like, instead of like every person that comes in with a sniffles and or coughs... Or an ear infection or... Oh my God, ear infection ear is infection the worst. Ear infection drives me crazy. <laughs> that's like the big send off for me. It's like... So horrid. It's horrid. It's yeah. like, that's the one time, I think we've had, we've had strep once that we treated with antibiotics with my oldest, and then someone tried to give us antibiotics for an ear infection, and it was like a big fight between my husband and I, because it was like, we're not using this. Like, yeah. I can make an ear oil, and we're going to see if that works, and if it doesn't, if it's actually like a really, like, if it's actually a bacterial infection, which is like kind of rare for ear infections, rare, unheard of for ear yeah. infections, then like, we can appropriately respond to this, yeah. and so we didn't, and we used... Like I think it was um, an olive oil, and I'll put cottonwood mm -hmm. and um, garlic, and then like some bee balm if I have it in there. But usually it's just garlic and olive oil. And I, I argued with a doctor when they were like, he never had an ear infection. Like this was a second one after mm -hmm. we like had the argument about the antibiotic. But there was another doctor that was like trying to tell me he did not have an, an ear infection on Friday. And I was like, well, I just treated it with this. And he's like, no, his ear is fine. And I was like, well, I know because I treated it with this. Right, right, right. You know, right. by the time we got there on Monday, and mm -hmm. it was like good to go. So the last time I was prescribed antibiotics was actually for an ear infection and I had severe vertigo and I felt like garbage. I was gonna take them because I felt so bad. Yeah. I got the bottle and it was amoxicillin and they were in bright blue capsules and I was like, 
I just can't do this. Yeah. I was like 80% of ear infections are viral. And by the time the oral antibiotic goes through and does all the things and gets to the tiny blood vessels here, are you really going to tell me there's enough antibiotic that's actually going to do a damn thing? No. Not really. No. I've always treated them topical. And I just had a colleague, that same colleague that's up in Boulder I was telling you about, she got um, swimmer's ear. And she was like, oh, it's really, really hurting. Yeah. What do we do? What do we do? Yeah. And I was like, you've got some poplar bud salve, some cottonwood bug salve she yeah. made. I was like, put that on it. Yeah. She's like, that was the that was the turning point for her. Yeah. No, you know, she was being stubborn that kind of about stuff. it. Absolutely. Yeah. We overuse antibiotics because we want our patients to feel better. But then well, we are making things Well, you get to send them home worse. with something and doctors aren't whipping up little remedies anymore. So you can't just like send them home with an ear oil or a tincture right. or whatever. Right. Um, or a salve that's not in the waiting room. Mm-mm. Like it should be. Like no. think if that's how it was, it'd be so amazing. It's kind of like a naturopathic. Do you have a naturopathic office? Yeah, so and I do have that. all the little. Yeah, I'd like have a base salve that I buy, um, and then I'll mix things in. Like, oh, you know, you got a really itchy, nasty thing. Like we need to put some cayenne so it helps to reduce the itch. Yeah. But people love it when yeah. they're like they get something that's so customized to them right there in yeah. the office. And, well, and it works. And it works. And you're not having to take pharmaceuticals. No. And the other thing that I think a lot of people forget about medications in general, and this goes to antibiotics too, they work one way. They do one thing. Herbs yeah, never absolutely. do just one thing. Yeah. That's what's so great about them and why antibiotic resistance to pot, cop, cottonwood bud or usnea or Oregon grape is like dang near impossible because there's so many different pathways and constituents the way they work. And then, oh, you mix it with garlic and this and this, and yeah. it's this synergistic effect that's so beautiful. Yeah. Well, you're just tackling it from all angles. Exactly. You know, like it is the synergistics. And it, that's the big thing about the plants is when you use plant medicine, you're using the whole plant. Mm-hmm. And when we use pharmaceuticals, we're doing the slice and dice game of like finding what the greatest thing was about whatever it is um, that they found that worked, and then we're isolating it. Mm-hmm. And the isolation is just like, They work, but they're not really treating like everything that goes along with that illness or with that symptom. Whereas plants kind of like, it's like, yeah, that constituent in that plant works, but then all these other energetics of that plant are also like soothing to the tissue or soothing Mm -hmm. to this or have some sort of effect on the body that's going to like make that remedy whole, Mm -hmm. which is synergistic to me. Yeah, absolutely. You know, like bringing that wholeness back. So, Mm -hmm. yeah, and that's what the bugs need. Like they need the attack of like a whole little like army it's yeah. not just a one thing no. that's where the resistance comes in is when mm-hmm. you have one thing that works and you keep making that work and work they they're clever yeah super clever MRSA is really big with Delta count Delta hospital oh interesting so when I moved back in like 2020 from the hospital yes yeah like I I within the, within the summer that I moved back in 2020 I had met I'm not even kidding five people in six months that had been in Delta Hospital and then were discharged with a MRSA infection on oral vancomycin and then had to go in periodically to get checked and IV vancomycin, which is like, doesn't really that work. You know what does though? And there's data on it, is poplar bud and Mm -hmm. propolis, Mm -hmm. propolis um, from the bees. And apparently I found a really cool one. Well, do you know why the propolis? Because of the poplar that they collect from. The bees collect from the poplar buds. And so they're going out, they're collecting all the resins Mm -hmm. of the poplar and that's what we're finding in the propolis. So that's where like propolis is like almost like it's like um, a, a little micro dose exactly. of like the cottonwoods and all these other pollens mm-hmm. and different things resins that are being collected from other plants mm-hmm. so yeah propolis is magical oh but then like cottonwoods magical like even for things um like strep and like those you know those kind of infections we make a tincture called mountain bitters and it's oregon grape and cottonwood and um hops is in there and there's like some honey in there. I feel like I'm missing an ingredient. Anyway, it's a, it's a bitters. So you would take it for like stomach digestion kind of stuff. But it's really good for the sore throat because 100%. cottonwood has this amad- amazing ability of being anti-inflammatory, antiviral, antibacterial, antifungal. Mm-hmm. And then it's just going to take that redness out. So I've watched that change the course of like sore throats coming on, um, which strep, again, is another one that's one of those big... Um, antibiotic abuse situations 100%. because sometimes people will just be taking antibiotics when they have no idea if it's strep or not you know right. and I've seen that time and time again with kids or with parents where one kid's sick with it and they assume the other kids might just get it yeah. or they might have it and there's no they're not testing the other kids which a lot of times like 
you're like there's kind of like a strep window like don't you feel like you see strep mm -hmm. mostly through like four to it's not usually nine year olds adult, like eight year olds even like six year under olds. 20 is and what so I've been there's like this window of, mm -hmm. of strepness and i feel like it's a big a, immuno attack right and so if you're not kicking the strep out appropriately you could be an immuno a compromised human right yeah. because you now have this like lingering bacteria that could be keep spiking so those people that you see getting it in adulthood and later on you're kind of like there's some sort of immunocompromisation that's going on Something here weird. right yeah um is how i look at it where i'm mm -hmm. like this isn't just about fighting the strep like when my kid got strep i was like no like and then you know i think we got it once i think maybe we got it two times in a row and i treated it differently the second time because i was like we must have not kicked it last year yeah fully so like you're staying on the antibiotics hard this time and i think we did the first time too but i added in more layers of herbs and stuff mm -hmm. um and then stuff to do immuno recovery so and then he never got it again you're saying a couple things one is you can do medications and herbalism yeah so great like it doesn't have to be either or, no. and I'm never going to be it's that the person. It's complementary medicine. It, it, oh, I hate that term, but yes, it should be the first medicine. <laughs> and then when this doesn't work, medicine. then we go to the pharmaceuticals <sighs> so that we preserve them. That's part yeah. of the stewardship, but we can do both at the same time. I was one of those kids. I had strep five times a year, that pink bubblegum penicillin. Mm. I'm, I've had penicillin so many times in my life that I am allergic to it now. I have I get have, rash from it. Yeah. Well, and you see that from amoxicillin. I mean, mm -hmm. you're seeing that... Um, response where kids are getting amoxicillin rashes and different and what do you think that is like that's is it a true allergy that's a good or is question it a, yeah I mean it's obviously high histamine response in the body yeah. where the body irritation trying to. Like, it's just you've killed the gut flora the mm -hmm. you got leaky gut like mm -hmm. it's just not a healthy situation at all um, yeah and parents say it so lightly that's the part that I'm like yeah I'm terrified when the uh, when the antibiotics have to come out my four-year-old hasn't been on anything isn't it great? It's so great. I'm, I'm like, someone... it's like a testimonial for her. I'm just like, oh God, thank God you did not get like any ear infections or she's mm -hmm. just been a little, yeah, well, not. That's what's we're like in the COVID with, times now. What's so great about herbs though is that herbs don't do the ticking, the, excuse me, the nuke bomb in the guts. They don't no, kill everything. No. And there's actually. Unless you're on like some hardcore wormwood or something or black walnut, in my opinion, for like months on end. For an or extended something. period an extended of time. Extended period that's of time. The, that's the thing. Where the gut's not being able to recover, but. With tinctures and herbs, like there's not the um, the time release dose, so that you're constantly killing through the day, t constantly medicating through the day. Um, you're giving it at that dose, mm -hmm. so the body's absorbing. It's like food, right? Mm -hmm. So you're taking it at that time, and then the body's recovering within a period of time. So if mm -hmm. you're doing like a three day regiment where you're taking them in the morning, maybe the middle of the day, you're having like a recovery period almost yeah. in the body to like go back to normal. Do you, yeah. you know what I mean? Right, right, right. Gets exposed, helps him, helps support. Yeah, like to use support, supports the immune system, supports yeah. the whatever. But the pharmaceutical, we love time release, or we love yeah. the doses where it's staying in the system because that's how they work. Yeah, whereas right. herbs kind of like don't. It's like you can kind of take them in chunks mm -hmm. instead of have to constantly like. And I think people think that where they're like, "Well, do I have to drink the tea all day?" And it's like, no, just like drink the fucking tea. Yeah, like once just, is great. Just drink just it. Drink the tea. Yeah, I try to get. I go through periods where I'm like, okay, I, I'm doing a little more homeopathy, or I'm doing a little more herbs, but I really try to push the tincture and the tea, especially when I've got a patient that's got a bladder infection. A bladder oh, infection. Oh, yeah. How else are you going to get it through? 100%. And like bladder infections, oftentimes people are being prescribed like Cipro or, or these other floxacins, which are say, very flocks. dangerous. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, totally like up. they have a black box warnings for breaking your Achilles tendon. Like they have a place. Mm -hmm for severe infections mm -hmm. like gonorrhea, mm -hmm. <laughs> in my mind, because that can cause such havoc on our oh, reproductive system. people get completely jacked up from oh, totally. Cipro and different things like yeah, that. Yeah, I had a patient when I was a student who was a floxy, and I was like, what's a floxy? Yeah. She's like, oh, you gotta look at this. And so yeah. I looked at it because I wanted to try and understand her story. Um, I have known three people in the last short period of time who have broken their Achilles tendon entirely. Wow. I'm like, that doesn't seem right. How do you right. break your Achilles? Like well, it's not it, even it was a snap or what? Snap. Yeah, one yeah. was a partial tear, well, the other like two they, were complete it's like tears. Disintegrating ligaments. Yeah, and so my question is: is like, does that happen immediately, mm. or is it downstream? I think it's a downstream. It's a downstream. Is what I've been seeing. So with bladder bladder infections, it seems like my older folks have a harder time kicking it, which mm -hmm. kind of makes sense. Mm -hmm. But well, they're already starting to hydrate it. Exactly. Right. Everybody's chronic, and we live in Colorado. So like, I think of mm. the body as like a desert and dehydration. So like. Um, all the tissues going through down to when you repeat it out, right? It's like kind of crispy, deserty. If you're not hydrating properly, or if you're not using demulcent herbs, we live in Colorado. We, live in Colorado. we need demulcent herbs, herbs every day, herbs, like, chronically. Yes. And so, um, 
if you're not doing that, you're like crispy inside. And so I think of as we age, we get crispier inside. Mm -hmm. And so when it rains in the desert, what happens? It like flash floods. It, yeah, totally. It, it totally just, goes just like through. goes through and mm -hmm. finds the channel that it can like pour it out mm -hmm. and it, it floods out the rivers, right? And so that's what happens in our body is it's like, well, I'm peeing. And it's like, well, no shit, you're peeing. Mm -hmm. But like you're not absorbing anything. Like it'd be better almost if you weren't peeing so totally. much because it'd be showing that you were like absorbing the water that you're intaking. Yeah. If you were intaking the water yeah, or yeah, if yeah. you were intaking the, like demolcent tea with the water. Um, so yeah, I think that is why, especially yeah. out here in the dry West where it's just like, we're all, we're all chronically slightly dehydrated. Yeah. Unless we're pushing demolcents. Um, uh, honey. Mm -hmm. is another really interesting one. And in the data, what conventional practitioners are doing is they're using medical grade honey, which is sterile, and they're still getting great benefits. Isn't that wild? I wonder what the benefits would be if they weren't sterilizing the honey. If it would be even greater. I think greater. you'd have a speedier, I wonder if you'd have a speedier recovery time. I, I wonder. But they're seeing From amazing the things in burn wounds, yep. and burn victims burn with wounds, honey. Yep. And even using it um, like post Partum tears is an amazing way to Ooh. use honey. That's what we, Ooh. I'm a home birth mom. And so that was what we would use for mm -hmm. like tears or anything mm -hmm. was honey. And it's such an amazing tissue, tissue regenerator, but it's so, um, like there's no pain with honey. Like honey is so, I don't know, what's that word? Like it's um, pain free. There's a word for that. Like pain. it's not anagelic, but it's just like, you don't get, there's no sensation with honey. Yeah. You know, like, and it's not an oily thing. It's not an antibiotic. It's not like you're right. slathering like, um, neosporin or something down there. You're right. just putting honey down there and it's a wound healer and yeah. it's humectant. Yep, exactly. And so that humectant property helps to like pull out any infection or anything mm -hmm. that would be going on there. And then that also just helps tissue to start to heal, especially yeah. weepy tissues mm -hmm. where you see that in like, you know, your downstairs is kind of things. Yeah. Um, Honey's amazing. Or with like burns too. Yeah. yeah. I, weepy I, things. Hadn't, burns are exactly. weepy. Blistery things, you know, uh -huh. blisters. The humectant piece and like really understanding, like I like to explain mechanisms, right? Like I'm very conventionally trained in my yeah. um, schooling. Humectant helps to, do how honey works is it pulls the infection, the little juicy bug, and it pulls that juice right out of it. Yep. So then it can't, it's immobilized. You basically just made it a desert. Yeah. Desert bug. Yeah. Dead. Yeah because it doesn't have the water that it needs to function. And it's a great property of honey. So great. It's so cool. And it makes it cool for like, mm -hmm. you can make infused honeys with different plants because it pulls out the properties mm -hmm. of the plants in that same nature. Yeah. So that's another fun thing. Yeah, now is kind of the time to be like the onion and the garlic honey. And yep. Yep. Yeah. And you can do weak cottonwood honey is amazing. Oh, you can do all ooh. sorts of like wild plants with honeys ooh. too. And so the cottonwood buds in the winter time is an amazing honey and it's really good for allergies, especially people mm -hmm. that react to like the cottonwood yeah, yeah, um, yeah. fluff and everything. Cause mm -hmm. it's kind of like, again, a little microdose of all those cottonwood resins that you find in propolis, which yeah. propolis is super helpful for allergies. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, cottonwood honey of your local honey is yeah. a nice way to. Local honey is the most important thing. Local the honey, honey that you're gonna important. buy at Costco, the honey you're gonna buy at the grocery store is not what it's we are talking about. Local about. Rasta. Honey, real honey and from has your like area a like white it needs film to be on the top within like 150 ra mile radius i yes. think you know like in gunnison where i live the bees don't really make it through the winter so everyone mm. tends to have a hard time having any kind of production thing with yeah. bees or honey um but in peonia land yeah, yeah, which yeah. is within that radius yeah. that's where we get a lot of our honey nice. from and yeah and that white i was works. i was buying it from uh I will not name the store, but I was buying it from a store and it is a local honey, but it's still a commercial honey. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't true honey. Mm -hmm. And how I've determined is it's got that white film on the top. Mm -hmm. And that's like, I don't know what that is. Honey has like over 200 different chemicals that we've identified so far. So the white film, I think can be an okay thing. It's, the, a, it's a good. I, I think that's a good, I think that that can be like a yeasty thing or it can be a decent and an okay thing because some of our like pure honey will come like that on the top of like a big five gallon. Yeah, and it's like drop. right on the top, it's not throughout. Yeah, and then the way you know it's really good honey from what I've been told in circumstances is if that honey sits for a while and it crystallizes, that's when you know you've got like raw honey. Yeah. And then you can crystallizes like scoop evenly. it. And, yeah, and like, I mean, honey doesn't go bad. Honey never goes bad. So you can reheat that and the crystallization will run out again and then you can keep using your honey. Mm -hmm. So. So I know I wonder about the white film, but I think it's kind of like a yeasty thing is how I think of it. I mean, it's everything synergistic. Yeah. Like it totally, yeah. Using honey as medicine dates all the way back to the Egyptian times yeah. that we've been able to identify so far. Mm -hmm. We'll say that. And like there were honey they found in, I don't remember which Pharaoh's tomb, but it was still good honey. Isn't that crazy? So crazy. Heat it on a pot and just melt it down a little bit. Mm -hmm. You know, take a little taste. Yeah. Oh, so great. Yeah. Um, 
what else? Cottonwood, let's talk about Oregon grape because that is one of my favorites. When I was doing like my little research for this, it's these herbs are kind of like, I put yarrow and licorice in a category of like, what do they not do? Yeah. I put propolis now and cottonwood bud in that category yep. as well. And but I feel everything like herbs is grape, what I call them. Gra uh, Oregon, Oregon grape, grape is kind of like that too. It is. It's like the benefits are across the board. Well, it's like I look at herbs and I look at them through the spectrum of like their energetics. So mm -hmm. like what do they have to offer um, with how they taste, feel, and then what their medicinal actions are. So what is it actually doing in the body? And Oregon grapes, one of those like, again, like cottonwood bitter but it's cooling, whereas mm -hmm. cottonwood's nice and spicy. A little warming. So it's like a warming herb. Mm -hmm. um, Oregon grape's gonna kind of cool things down a little bit, but again, it's got all these spectrums that it can host from, where it's astringent, it's drying um, that way, where that helps with healing infection, or the, the antimicrobial properties. So it's Super. high in berberine, mm -hmm. and berberine's one of those like majorly sought after constituents, one that we've like spliced and diced, and we've yeah. abused completely by wiping out stands of golden seal all over like the mm -hmm. Northeast. Um, and through the Midwest. And so golden seal is now like a threatened plant, endangered yeah. plant in the United States. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that's from over harvesting, whether that's from herbalism times, but a lot, I think it's a lot of pharmaceutical harvesting where they're going after that berberine rich root that is golden seal. Yeah. And it works wonders. I mean, it works so good. It's so good. Yeah. And we have it out here everywhere with Oregon mm -hmm. grape, which grows like on all these cliffy mountainsides mm -hmm. and. They're a lot places. smaller than they are in the Pacific Northwest. They're so tiny here. Uh -huh. They're little dainty things. It makes me then think you're they're like a little more bushes. like compact, like they're more potent energy. Yeah, when you scratch a root, I mean, they're so yellow. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's a good one. Berberine a little while ago, and I don't know if you saw this on any of your social media platforms, was going around as nature's ozembic. Slightly off topic, Dude, but... Ozembic, I can't... Oh my, my God, ozembic is I a freaking like nightmare. I found about it in May and was like, you're doing what? What is it called again? Can you write that down so I can look this up? Yeah. And then I was just like, hor I've been horrified for months. Yeah. And now people are like getting, I, we can't, well, it's a whole no, no other tangent. It is. But it's not <sighs> nature's ozempic. But the th I think the thing that people are getting confused about it is we do use berberine for diabetes. For diabetes, and yeah. it works one to one with metformin, a thousand milligrams for a thousand milligrams. And of I've berberine. seen it work really good oh, for totally. people. Like 100%. it can be really similarly interchanged. But I wonder again if the benefits would be even more fold if we were using the whole herb. I'm a whole herb user. So I preferred as well. Use Oregon grape with leaves or flowers and the root. Oh my God, the flowers taste so good. They do. And so when I first started herbalism, nobody was talking about the leaves or the flowers. And I was just like, or maybe it was just the flowers. And I was like, why is no one talking about the, like, the there's so the much plant. medicine right in these, like all mm -hmm. this little fluff, you know, like, mm -hmm. why are we not taking the whole plant? Why would we be just discarding like this huge pile of leaves and just get all these scrawny little roots? So I use the whole plant. Cool. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. And same with cottonwood. Like I used to go through um, yeah, I saw your post and I was like, oh my God, that's brilliant because yeah. I hate the tanking So picking, I used to sit there and it was like before children, <laughs> I'm a 10 year old and four year old now, so this has been a long time ago and I would pick off buds and like, it's not worth it. It takes so much time to go through and pick mm -hmm. off the buds off your branches and the branches, if you chew on a branch, there's so much medicine within the outer bark and the inner bark. And so I just started deciding to be a lazy herbalist and just start chopping up my branches and then Matt Springer was like, I'm gonna run the Mormon tea through oh, a wood chipper. And yes. I was like, that's so the brilliant. Wood chipper. Mm -hmm. And then that's when I was like, I need a wood chipper, Matt. And then he ran Cottonwood through a wood chipper and I was like, that was brilliant. Mm -hmm. And so then this year we got a wood chipper. Yeah. So we'll run like the pinion through it, the Cottonwood. Um, yeah, it's genius. Pine. It makes everything like, it so makes genius. 50 pounds in 15 minutes, yeah. like process. Well, and the research article that I found specifically on Poplar that was published in 2020, they were talking about using the whole plant, and I had yeah. forgot that I saw your the video. Bark I was like, makes oh my it God, better. That makes so much sense. Yeah. The one caveat I will give, and I'm really, I'm kind of tempted, you know, if I don't know anybody that actually has an aspirin allergy, which is a salicylate yep. allergy, yep. and cottonwood bud and propolis do contain salicylates. Do. My question would be is like, is the person actually allergic to aspirin? Like, what does aspirin allergy Aspirin is race, a, race syndrome a, in kiddos. It's like a salicylic acid or a salicylate allergy. Yeah. Is what I think it could be. Totally. But I've never seen, I've seen um, one woman react with, we make a cottonwood cream. Yeah. And so there's one woman that I saw react after months of use and like got like a hive thing. Mm -hmm. And the only thing she could think of that it was, was that cream. Yeah. 
Um, so is was, that an allergy or is that like more of she was overusing it and irritating maybe? Maybe, hmm. you know, I mean we use that cream, it's an anti-inflammatory cream. Like people compare the Cottonwood Bliss Butter Cream to like CBD cream products because oh of God. how strong it is as taking pain away. Oh, it works so good for It pain. works amazing and then like healing cracked skin mm -hmm. and dry skin and it's like total tissue healer. I made a beautiful Cottonwood salve from um, a bunch of buds that had fallen when I was in Seattle still and I still had the jar and when we still lived in Hodge kiss one of my old neighbors he walked his little dog Pina and he's like walking one day with a nasty limp and I was like what the frick happened to you yeah and I I was like hold on a minute like let me run inside let me give this let me slather you up I gave him a jar of it and I'm like leaving I'm you know a couple a couple days later you know I just gave him like a sample size yeah and a couple days later he's like chasing me down he was limping yeah and he's chasing me down I'm driving my car to go to my clinic to get to see a patient and he's like, you have to give me more of that. That works better than anything I have used so far. It's and I amazing. Was like, yeah. I was like, huh? Cottonwood for the win. Because I've used it for other things, but not pain. I didn't even like, you know, oh, it's constantly so, learning. Yeah. So internal, external, it's one of the greats. Like mm -hmm. it's something that I've had a love affair with Cottonwood for years. I feel like it was like my first kind of herbal ally or whatever yeah. it was Cottonwood. Yeah. Moving down to the valley over here is where I really got into herbalism over in Gunnison. And you're just surrounded by cottonwoods. Everywhere. And once I learned that cottonwood had a medicine, I was like, oh my God, this is like the most sustainable thing. It's the right beavers here. take down the trees, the wind blows down all the branches, and you never really even have to touch a living tree. And you nope. just get the, the branches that, as they're blown down, and it's so great. And then you pull out the wood chipper now. It's like... Freaking brilliant. I love when we make things simple and we try to make things too complicated, right? Like we need well, the like, constituent. What's the difference between blades going like this and your pruners? You know what I mean? There's not. There's not. No. And time, like the amount that and you time. can make now. Yeah. So. Mm. Usnia. Mm. Usnia, I learned in school, actually, which is old man's beard. Usnia. Oh, I forget its scientific name, but Usnia, Usnia. species. Yes. It's, it's, that's, that's its genus. That's its genus, yeah. yeah. And it's the species. It looks pretty good up on the mountains. That's where I've usually grabbed it from yep. is when I'm out, out snowboarding. That's how I am. I'm always grabbing mm -hmm. from the fallen branches. Exactly. Yeah. Where When it looks like it's good and healthy. Yeah. I learned that it's in, not endangered, but it's threatened in the wild. And I wonder if it's partially because usnea is a type of lichen, right? Mm -hmm. And it hangs in the trees mm -hmm. and it gets its nutrients from the air, mm -hmm. which we humans have unfortunately exactly polluted right. hugely. So that's how we teach about usnea, is that, um, yeah, usnea is getting threatened, but it's not like one of those, um, we picked too much usnea things. It's like more of one of those, we've abused our environment too much and now the Oh, the places you see Usnia is in pristine environments. Yeah. So, um, like up in the West Elks or, mm -hmm. um, you know, kind of going up into our mountains that way, mm -hmm. Crested Butte area, mm -hmm. is full of Usnia. And there's not a lot of humans up there. We don't, we're in the middle of the state of Colorado. There's not a lot of pollution. We're far enough away from Denver where that air pollution's dwindled by then. We're mm -hmm. far enough away from like Salt Lake City that the air pollution's dwindled by then. So we really just have like our big cities, our Montrose and Grand Junction, which aren't like, to me, technically like functioning factory towns or something like that. Like you're not having that gaseous outpour. Yeah. They're little rural Like cities. downtown Denver I mean, with that nasty dog. The dog yeah. chow thing. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it's like we have really good freaking air here. We have good water. We have good air. Mm -hmm. Usnia loves it. So mm -hmm. you don't see it in places that are getting crept upon from urban sprawl. That's where yeah. I think you're starting to see. But you're also seeing the death of the forest. Right. So... Right, and those forests up in the West Elks. It's oh. like, are we seeing the death of the forest or are we seeing the death of Usnia? It's like, we're seeing the death of the forest right. before we're seeing the death of Usnia. Mm -hmm. And so the Usnia can't survive in those trees. One of the first, I think I was maybe first or second year in school, there was a weekend herbalism conference. I can't remember the name of the guy who was talking, but he was an herbalist and his brother was a surgeon. And they were doing a trip in Kenya to mm -hmm. help like, you know, surgeries oh, cool. and la la la. They could not get any rocks to save their life. You know what they were using? What? Usnia and honey. For the surgical wounds wow. with excellent success. Pat, like the, 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 like a tincture of it or I'm not making sure if they were or like the packing I of the usnea. No, they were packing. Of that too. You can like pack. I believe it. They've packed wounds with usnea. Like mm -hmm. that's been um, done in terms I mean, of I have joked, stuff. I have joked with my husband, like if I fall down and like I get really hurt, like there's almost always yarrow around. Yeah. Like Pack you're gonna, it. you're gonna chew it up and spit exactly. It on you're there. gonna spit poultice it and put it right on there. <laughs> if I'm bleeding out, find the yarrow <laughs> yeah. and spit it out on me. Yep, be the sexiest thing I've ever seen you do. <laughs> yeah, we have students practicing that like all the time at plant camp, <laughs> where it's like, oh my god, you're bleeding, find the yarrow, and yep. then like the kids love it, everybody loves it. They're spitting on each it. other. It's great. <laughs> 
that's so good. Uh, uh, okay, what was the other? There was. That was what? what else about usnea? Well, the interesting thing too with usnea is that it has to be heated to extract right. the usnea. Because the Usnic. is it chitin? Is it the chitin? That is it because that's what makes it hard. I can't remember if it's. I like think fungus. it's like the usneic acid and yeah. like how it breaks down, and there needs to be a heat component. So. Um, the alcohol, like that jar of alcohol kind of needs to be heated. Not yeah. like heat your alcohol in open flame or like release the alcohol. It has to be like a closed jar heated, mm -hmm. but that's a way that they make it. So that's why teas are really good too. Mm -hmm. And it's another demulcent herb. And if you look oh. at it, it kind of looks like lung bronchioles. Totally, totally, totally. Right? Like yeah, as it yeah, hangs yeah. from the trees. And so I like to think it's like the lungs of the forest. So yeah. it's like your lungs can't live in a toxic environment. So. Yeah. You'll see it in those pristine forests, but if you make a tea from it, like we put it in our smoky lungs brew, mm -hmm. along with like other demulcent teas or other mm -hmm. demulcent herbs like marshmallow and linden and plantain and yada yada. But it's another demulcent and super antimicrobial that's going to have this direct relationship to the lungs. Yeah. So it's something like really good for like severe lung infections. I even yeah. like to steam it. Oh. Like I'll throw it in. It doesn't smell like anything. No. But I just have this theory that the vapors, because it's heat activated that way, mm -hmm. that I think some of those properties are carried up in the steam. Like I just have this intentional, like in instinctual like feeling about that and I've used usnea and steams for a decade mm -hmm. and I'll throw things like sagebrush in there or pine or oregano or thyme yeah. you know something from the kitchen but usnea is amazing and mm -hmm. I just there's something with that synergistic of that heat release that I'm like no it's like I need to be an antimicrobial it steam. I really don't have a lot of experience with it. Like yeah. I learned about it in school, and anything that I learned that was like eh, questionable, mm -hmm. I was like, okay, I'm not going to use. I'm going to use something else. Yeah. I use a lot of propolis. I see quite a bit of IBD in my practice, mm -hmm. and propolis. I mean, I've gotten to see some really cool things, and I'm like blown away. Yeah. With people not choosing not to be on medications, and then you know, within a couple of months with a propolis as like a 10% in a tincture formula, no longer having bleeding, no longer having urgency, like feeling substantially better, Yeah, which is really cool. Well, it's tissue knitting. It's, it's that anti-inflammatory, um, the like restoration, like I think of it as like, I think of those herbs as like a trophil restorative. 100%. As opposed to like our antibiotics. Mm -hmm. It's like they're going in and they're actually like healing the organ yeah. or healing the tissue. Yeah. And they're actually bringing like a restoration to it, not just like, murdering the problem no. you know what i mean or because that's, that's the, problem, the thing about like, herbs they don't do just yeah, one thing yeah they have the multifaceted, and it shows up in the data MRSA, c diff this well not specific candida auris but the candida albicans which is you know your typical candidiasis where it gets really weirded out when you got like thrush or like vaginal candida mm -hmm. like another one cottonwood's great for same with oregon grapes yeah. amazing for candida oregon grapes one of my of favorite antifungals and favorite ones for like um, cleaning up the guts if someone 100%. has a candida overgrowth. Yeah, I, I use organ grape a lot. It's just, yeah. it's a good one. And it's one of the ones that I have an affinity towards. And I feel like, you know, this is kind of like an herbalism thing, but the herbs that I have more affinity for, I know better and they work better for me. Yeah. Which is interesting. It's like your repertoire. Yeah. I always say it's like your encyclopedia. Mm -hmm. And so it's like we all have this stash that we keep stashing back in the brain of all the herbs that we keep learning. And then the more you use them, I think the more they wow you. Yeah. Like sometimes it's like, oh, lemon balm, it's just lemon balm. And then you like start ritually using lemon balm or something and you're like, wow, I like totally shifted my life or like yeah. out of a funk or something. You know, I mean, like you see Graves disease. I have seen multiple Graves disease patients, lemon balm, like a piss. Um, and what is the other L? The three L's. Uh, Leonaris. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. What's like a piss? Lycopis is um, so oh motherwort lemon balm. Lycopis, what is, I don't only really know it as lycopis. Yeah, it grows really tall. It grows really intensely. It's in the Laminaceae family. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm gonna but, look it up. Um, yeah, it's so specifically it's specifically like, for hyperthyroid. I, I feel like you get yeah. The more familiar you get, the more you kind of get wild. Like I still get wild by so many formulas. Yeah. Right, like it did what? Okay. Well, and each person is, it's going to respond a little bit different to as well. You know, I, I like to show that herbalism has data. One person was like, oh, you're a naturopath. You don't know biochemistry. I was like, bitch, I was a biochemistry tutor. Yeah. I actually really love biochemistry. I love the nerdy aspect of the constituents of the herbal, of it's herbalism. what makes the web work. It's exactly. Like what makes it all. And when we can use those to our advantage, we're actually protecting the benefits of antibiotics. I don't want gonorrhea. I really no. don't. I haven't like, had it, but... Think if you could get it while at a swimming pool or something. Like, think if it got to a point where, oh like, 
I don't know. Like, don't could know. that be a thing? You like, can't get it, it from a toilet seat, but like, you know. But like, what if it, I don't know. A lot of people Like, what if it could be just flown out? I mean, I'm probably making this up. But asymptomatic. my point is. It, that's the problem. Is that and we all want to get after it. So, yeah, we, don't want, exactly. we don't want it. We don't want it. And I don't want someone to have pelvic inflammatory disease. I want to be able to use antibiotics when we have a serious infection and not be frivolous. The WHO, 90% of world's population uses herbalism. Mm -hmm. And then in the good old US of A, we somehow have this whole thing that herbs are super dangerous and they're all gonna kill us and they're mm -hmm. not effective. No, we wanna put like laws against it. And yeah. so, like I recently had to um, totally mess up our whole website because of our POS system, because of Square. Right. Um, and so they now have banned Kava. You can't what? use Kava. So they wouldn't, they, they held all my funds because I had CBD on the website, which has been fine. And I've been using them for like 10 years, like five, 10 years That's using so CBD. That's weird. For whatever reason with our website update, we obviously said too much about what CBD could do, but we were like really careful on like right, not right, 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 right. being it's supportive in the red. instead of yeah, yeah, supportive and like it could do or it might uh, you know rhetoric. So they were like, put, I mean, they put my funds on hold for like six weeks, eight weeks from our online store. So oh. I would have like fifteen grand on hold. Like it was like some like crazy amount of money for because a, a of second Kava? because of the CBD products. Um, saying too much and then they were like well on top and it was like you're talking like a robot so it like took me eight weeks to get through to this whole system Whoa. and then it was kind of like and then i'm calling and freaking out finally at the end i mean but i was freaking out the whole time anyway the kava got pulled up they were like oh and you also have a kava so you need to take kava off your website and i was like kava and they're like yeah square is now not supporting kava to which to me is like okay what's going on deeper than that because yeah. kava is starting to get brought up right now where we have like Kava bars popping up more, and maybe that's why they've gone to this direction is that they don't want to support Kava bars, so they've pulled themselves from that's being weird. a POS system for like places like that, and maybe sure. that's what it's stemming from, or the system's just getting that's rockier. Weird. And I'd rockier. be far more concerned about kratom. Like I, I, I have know. a friend who recently OD'd. <gasps> um, he was clean for because um, it's a over mild six opiate. Weeks. His kratom was laced with fentanyl. Is the only thing we can put together. Oh no. That was in June, and so that was the only things they could find in his system was that there was a small amount of fentanyl and that there was also kratom. And so we can only, because we can't find what he took. Mm -hmm. And so the only thing we can think is that someone gave him kratom and he was trying to stay clean, and yeah. the kratom is what took him out, which is so fucked up. Like, people Definitely. are using kratom to get off of these opiates, and now people are lacing kratom to make it feel heavier, See, stronger. And, and this like, is, is that real? And then we looked up on the freaking CDC, and there's reports on that. Yep, I believe it. Like, there's a stat on it that our kratom is being laced, and yeah. it's just like... So, no, I've lost a friend to that in the last couple of months where That's that was so laced. And this brings herbs. to the point where you need to get from a reputable source, not the weird kratom bar down the no, street no. or your friend or in the back alley. Or even your friend who got it from someone because like no. people are using press machines and all sorts yes. of shit. And then your fentanyl or your heroin or your kratom, if they're pressing like pills or they're just using a pack, I mean, it's such a microscopic amount of fentanyl that can take someone out 100%. after you've been in recovery. Yeah. And so. I mean, fentanyl is a hundred times stronger than her morphine. 50 times stronger yeah. than, and like it's, there's different flavors of fentanyl. We're kind of getting off topic now, but this is. But not, because that's mixing with herbalism. <laughs> right, like it is mixing with herbalism. You know, like it's affecting, it's affected me personally. This was a kid I grew up with. Like I've uh, known him my whole life. So it's like. So anyway. this, we have to pick from reputable sources. Like it's not, like you're an herbalist. I'm an naturopathic doctor. I'm very particular about where I source my herbs from. Mm -hmm. You know, I do love Mountain Rose and I love what they offer, but they, I don't need my nettle from Hungary. I don't need their outsource. No. You know, like I can support a community. I can support yes. a farmer. And that's a network that we exactly. really dove into in the last five years is like, getting farmers to farm our plants. Yep, locally. And locally, like yes. within the, the, like we live in Snowville, so we can't do a lot there, but just over the, the hillside yeah, is Pan this beautiful great. valley that we can harbor so much growth from. Mm -hmm. um, and it's brilliant how much we've been able to bring in from like the last three years. Like it's incredible. I don't even order for Mountain Rose. I might order like one or two things just yeah. because I can't get Solomon Seal anywhere else or mm -hmm. something like a little obscure. Yeah. Um, but other than that, like I try and, I, I kind of try not to support that many more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the bigger herbal, herbal companies. Like Same. we go to small farmers and if we can't get it from small farmers then we'll... That was kind of my like 
come to Jesus moment when Matt was talking to me. He's like, you know, it's and a lot I want to pay the farmers more. Exactly, I like it's insane to pay fifteen dollars for a pound of any herb. Like that's just insane. I'm it's sorry, that farmer so. de- 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 deserves thirty dollars. I mean, I was paying herb farmers. I was telling Matt to raise his prices. And Sunny, and over in the, I was like, you gotta raise your prices. Like, yeah, I gotta pay you more. For, like that's sixty dollars a pound calendula. That's not. Because you have to twenty dollars a hand. pound There's calendula. Not a I'm not going for that. It. Like, yeah. it's so much manual work, and uh, people will push back on the cost of herbs. Insurance doesn't cover it. No, you're right. Insurance doesn't cover it. Insurance. We can have a whole nother multiple hour conversation <laughs> about insurance as a whole. But then I get a person that comes into my office like they did the, um, earlier this week, and they're like, "You're actually really affordable price." They don't have insurance. They're self-employed. Yeah. They understand the benefit. Also, home birth, free birth, actually. Yeah. Yeah. That was a new thing. There's quite a few families in there's Panama that are There's a lot of free, free birthers. It's great. That was where I was up against because um, my little muffin went breach. And then also, I mean, our, our midwife was two hours away in Salida. So oh, it was like... it's kind of far. She was almost a free birth. Whoop. I'm a fast birther. Well, that's good. <laughs> so it's like the next time it could be. <laughs> so herbs have a very important place. Kind of want to wrap up here. Herbs have a very important place in our repertoire mm-hmm. for treating all of the things that we think about that we need antibiotics for, strep, skin infections, la 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 la, and done appropriately. I can't say that enough because there c- comes a time, okay, we've done all the herbs and like, I'm it's worried it's in Yeah, It's not working, you, yeah. need, you need the topical mepiracin. That's why yeah. we save those for just in case and we have those on hand, but we cannot keep using antibiotics the way that we do in this country. Like we are killing ourselves. Yeah. And we're running out of a very powerful. We're not only killing medicine. ourselves; we're killing each other. Yeah, yeah. I mean, because that's that's the gist of it. Like we all watched how diseases spread in the last three years. You know, we've all kind of become a little immunologists or whatever, mm-hmm. watching it all Quite happen. Yeah. You know? um, and so it's not just ourselves; it's a it's a, it's it's our planet. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like once stuff gets too out of hand, it's kind of like. It, it, yeah, it's, it's that's where stewardship comes in. Like yeah. we need to be mindful about our use. Doctors need to be less pushover. I know you don't want your patients to feel bad, but sometimes you just need water and you just need to sleep. Sometimes you need a fucking bath. Sometimes you need a fucking bath. I agree with you. Like, literally, Get in a like, cat like, bath. A bath. Like you could be doing something so simple that would make you feel so much better. That would have saved you going to the doctor. That you would have felt better from in an hour that you probably would have dropped your fever from that wouldn't make exactly. you take even a Tylenol yep. and you would have gone to bed. And I did my last talk on fevers and I talked about catnip baths. Yeah, they're like, perfect. They're so great. They're so great Underused, but it, again, it took two generations for us to complete so cat ours, sitting there just like waiting for you outside your bath. <laughs> our entire herbal understanding. Yeah. You know, I met a man when I was still living in Hodgkiss and I was harvesting from a linden tree. He's from Austria. And he was like, oh yeah, like what do you call this plant? I said, oh, Linden. He's like, oh, we call it li- Lipa where I'm from. Yeah. I was like, oh, that's so cool. Isn't like, it to have so that cool? connection. But again, 90% of the world uses herbs. And then in the United States, we just like, we don't. They're too no. dangerous. They're too scary. They're going to kill everybody. Yeah, no, I had a similar <laughs> moment like that with people from, I think they're from Germany and they were talking about plantain. They were showing me the plants that were the most precious to them. And it was like plantain, yarrow. Um, and they were describing them to me, and I was like, oh, you're talking about this plant, it's right over here. And we mm. were up on Kevlar Pass, and I was like, oh, you're talking about this plant, it's right over here. And they told me all their names for it, and it was amazing, because I knew exactly what they were talking about from what they said it did, mm-hmm. what it looked like, and I, it was, you know, yeah. it's plant speak. Plant medicine is powerful medicine. Yeah. It should not be pushed to the side. It's not complimentary. It should be the first line of care for mm-hmm. infection mm-hmm. support. And hospitals, like I said, with honey, the Medi Honey, like this is a big brand of freaking bandages. Like this is, they yeah, have made They capitalized. Money. They capitalized. These are working hard. Mm-hmm. There's a place. So we talked about antibiotic resistance, the importance of using antibiotics appropriately so we don't end up with more super gonorrhea. I don't want that. You don't want that. No one wants that. Nobody wants that. Antibiotic stewardship is the appropriate use of medication antibiotics so that we don't run out. Using herbs instead, using an astute herbalist to help you or a good naturopathic doctor. There's not many of us that use herbs the way that we're kind of talking about using them, but I want Brianna to kind of share about her store because you guys can have access to these good products we've been talking about. Yeah, so we have an online store. It's rooted-apothecary.com. We also have two physical locations in Gunnison and in Crested Butte, Colorado. And within there, we have kind of something for anything. We have a whole line of teas that help for a host of different ailments. We have a whole line of tinctures. Um, we use medicinal mushrooms. We use herbs. We also have skincare, and everything's organic, wild crafted. Um, I mean, beyond organic. I think some of our farmers are much more than They're what so you good. get the certification for. Um, 
And so we make remedies and we make herbal remedies that are readily available for people to use instead of having to go to the pharmacy, you know, like an ouchie ointment salve that has all the herbs that we've talked about here. It's got cottonwood, usnea, and Oregon grape in it. And that's our replacement for Neosporin. And we've, I've been making that. I started as a farmer's market over 10 years ago in Crested Butte. And that was one of the first saps. And we have people using it all over the world. It's kind of amazing. And mm -hmm. it's because it works so well at healing wounds and being that first aid ointment, which you don't need to just like slather a And there's resistance to Neosporin too. I know, and so Ugh. that resistance to that. So anyway. That's what we do. <laughs> I read it yeah. about the carry. Yep. All right.